My guest today is Chemi Lamo. Chemi Lamo is an Indian-born Canadian Tibetan student leader and activist. Chemi Lamo, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Abhijit. You're most welcome. So what's your story like? You were born in India and now you are living in Canada. So what's your what's your journey been like? Mm -hmm. So I was born actually in Karnataka and raised in uh, Tamil Nadu for about half my life. Um, and I moved to Toronto at, at about age 11. Um, as a Tibetan, I was born as a stateless refugee in India. So despite being born in India, uh, I'm not really considered an Indian, um, rather a Tibetan refugee. And so when we moved to Canada um, by naturalization, um, I was able to get my citizenship. Um, and so now I identify as a Tibetan Canadian citizen. Right. So do Tibetans who live in India have Indian citizenship? Do they acquire the citizenship or are they stateless technically technically they are stateless there is a clause within uh sort of the indian legislation where there is a period of time frame uh, i believe in the 60s uh, folks that were born in between uh 50 something to 60 something they have the ability to apply for indian citizenship but after that uh my understanding of uh sort of the indian legislation is that we are stateless folks um and of course with time Things have changed around where some Tibetans have been able to get, acquire Indian passports. Uh, similarly, some Tibetans in Nepal actually have also been able to get their uh, papers, which is called Nagrita and such. Um, however, mo generally speaking, most Tibetans do not have uh, Indian or Nepali citizenship as of yet. All right, I see. So what was the story of your family like? When did they leave Tibet? When did they come to India? And why India? Why not some other country? What was the reason for that? Mm hmm. So, um, you know, uh, as we know in sort of the international world, uh, Tibet's annexation and illegal occupation by the Chinese government happened um, sort of in the 1951 to 59 period. And so in 59, when His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, fled into India, uh, you know, around 80,000 Tibetans fl uh, fled, you know, following him into India. And so my grandparents were a part of that sort of uh, generation. And so my parents were actually born in the borders. So, you know, my mom's uh, sort of um, uh, where she was born is sort of in the Sikkim, Gangtok area. And my dad is also sort of in that border area. Of course, in their papers, it's a little bit uh, more confusing, but, um, from the stories that I've grown up with, it is that they were actually born en route so that while they were traveling um, and then slowly they made their way to Karnataka where the settlement camps were. Um, I remember, you know, when I was young that some, uh, my mom would tell me stories about our grandparents actually being uh, road workers. They were building pa the Natula Pass. Um, and so a lot of the road that was built around uh, Northeast is actually by the Tibetan refugees at a very low cost, backbreaking jobs, which explains why most of them don't live as long as well. Um, so I've uh, lost all my grandparents except for my little grandma, a paternal grandma now, who still lives in Karnataka, Mysore, where there's a settlement camp. I see, I see. So I thought that most of the Tibetans were living in the Dharamsala region in northern India. So it looks like there are people in the south as well. I wasn't yeah. aware of that. Yeah, definitely. So we do have a huge population in Dharamsala. And of course, His Holiness is uh, sort of our principal residence is currently in uh, Dharamsala. Um, and then we have our central Tibetan administration, which is sort of our government in exile that also operates um, in Dharamsala. However, we do have settlements all across India. Um, and, you know, Mysore being one of the main ones where there are, I think, more than 13 or 15 camps in different regions of Mysore. And then in addition to that, we have Tibetan entrepreneurs, shopkeepers who sell, you know, um, have small businesses where they sell sweaters and such all across India. I recent, my parents actually moved to Tamil Nadu because of that. And what's the Tibetan diaspora like in North America? Is that sizable or is that just a few people? Oh, definitely sizable. So uh, the, the Tibetan community has definitely increased in size, um, you know, since the 70s, I would believe, um, in Canada and in sort of New York, um, we have a population of almost 10,000 Tibetans. So after India, I would say, you know, uh, oftentimes when I introduce myself as a Toronto-based uh, Toronto Tibetan-Canadian, I always say it's like 
almost the second largest diaspora in the world, um, where we have almost 10,000 Tibetans living here in Toronto. And New York gives us a, quite the competition, but they're kind of spread out. But Toronto, we're quite united. And how's the situation like vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese? Because there's a sizable Chinese presence also in North America. Now, you yourself, I hear that you ran into some problems as a student leader. Could you tell a little bit about that? What 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 you had to face? Yeah, for sure. Uh, the presence of the Chinese community is definitely large, um, but. Mm -hmm. That goes to say, just like how there are, you know, uh, Indian folks all around the world where we have uh, Indian town. Uh, similarly, there's a Chinatown almost in every corner of this world. But that's, I believe, partly because of their culture and also their just sizable population. Um, with that said, you know, uh, for me personally, my journey has been such that I've always been very active about my Tibetan identity and the Tibetan community and the sort of the Tibetan struggle and plight. Um, and when I ran for student union elections at my university, I ran for the president uh, position. And when I did just days before I was elected, um, you know, the end of the election period, I had a storm of uh, threats um, and it was in the thousands of death threats and rape threats uh, against me and my family members um, saying that, you know, uh, she doesn't deserve to be a president because she is a, a, a pro Tibet person. Um, and that was sort of their argument. It was nothing about my abilities to lead the student body or my past experiences uh, and contributions to the student community uh, at the university. And um, yeah, and so that, led to sort of a large international case of um, the harassment and intimidation tactics that the Chinese government is actually using um, beyond their sort of area, but beyond China, for example, in other free and open democratic societies to ultimately control the narrative about China and any sort of critique or dissent um, against sort of the Chinese government and uh, they sort of want to tackle any of it. And we saw, I saw a little bit of that uh, during 2019, my election period. And what action was taken against these people who were issuing threats to you? This is an ongoing struggle. So that's why I've been, you know, I've actually done testimonies to the House of Commons, the Parliament of uh, the Canadian government, um, and interacted with actually every level of security that one can imagine. So from campus police, or going to Toronto police, then going on to the RCMP, which is the Royal County um, Mounted Police, Canadian Mounted Police, uh, and then also the Secret Services Agency, like the CSIS. Uh, and I've had multiple interactions with each of these individuals and you know um, uh, entities. And yet, till this day, I don't have a single paper that says here's a report of all the things that has been done. Um, the only time I got sort of a back uh, sort of feedback was when I de dealt with Toronto police and they said they're going to have to translate a lot of the comments and messages that I've received to determine whether or not it is truly a, um, a criminal offense. You know, because cyberbullying happens, you know, um, as you are also a public figure, you know, I'm sure there are folks that are interested and very much enjoy your content, but there, there are also people that don't. And so similarly, um, you know, they were kind of like, oh, well, you know, because you're out in the public eye and you're standing, standing for public office in many ways, you'll, you'd be subjected to uh, negative comments. But um, I made the case that these are not just negative comments. These are threats um, to my life and also people that are around me. And so they had to do an investigation and when they did you know two weeks later they said we started to go through some of the comments and we noticed at least 10 of these threats and they said these are death threats and rape threats uh directly at you and they actually might harm you uh and they said well would you like to now proceed with starting a case and i'm like yes of course what do you mean would you would i like to um and so yeah, it was actually shocking to have that sort of experience as a Tibetan Canadian, like as a Canadian citizen, you know, it is my right to have the ability to express my thoughts and um, also run for student office without being subjected to this type of violence. Um, but yeah, so to this day, I actually still do not have a response, which is why I continue to do a lot of the advocacy work that I do with uh, various coalitions, including uh, this coalition of human rights uh, violations by China in with Amnesty International. And we actually have had multiple closed door meetings with uh, Global Affairs Canada when we've also submitted a report, uh, to, you know, 
detailing the sort of harassment and intimidation tactics that the Chinese government has been using to target not just me, but a lot of other individuals. And, you know, one could also start talking about the Uyghur situation. There are Uyghur family members that are being surveilled left, right and center in all across the world, uh, not just in East Pakistan, but elsewhere. So similarly, tactics are being used within the Tibetan community. Just recently, we also heard about an NYPD police officer in New York um, who was it turned out to be like a spy, a Chinese spy who was spying on the Tibetan community. And so this uh, news about Chinese spies being found in Tibetan communities is so common. In India also, we heard recently news about that. There was one in Sweden. So the Chinese government is definitely investing a whole lot of resources in, one, their propaganda, but two, to also control the narrative about um, what China wants the world to believe. It's quite strange that North American governments, the two North American governments, are so insensitive towards the cause of the Tibetan people when they are so proactive in talking about the Xinjiang situation and the Uyghurs. Do you notice a dichotomy in the way they behave, or the, the attitudes towards the Tibetans and the other cause? Um, I definitely don't want to sort of compare the two situations because the situation inside East Pakistan is definitely dire, right? There has been, there is and has been a genocide being committed. Uh, and so the attention that they're getting is completely justifiable. And in fact, I would push the governments to do more. Um, regarding the Tibetan situation, you know, um, we've been in this game for quite long. Uh, we've received the international attention uh, since the 1970s. Uh, we also know the 1996 uh, Free Tibet concert. Like, you know, it was really in the international stage in uh, during those times. But I think the shift really became in 2008 uh, because the Summer Olympics was held uh, by Beijing uh, or by China. And after that, you know, um, I mean, first of all, during that, uh, there was huge uprisings of Tibetans, both inside and outside of Tibet. And uh, during that time, you know, we continue to tell the world uh, that this is going to be a critical time for Tibet. And lo and behold, you know, access to Tibet became completely impossible right after that. And uh, now getting information out is terribly hard. So part of the reason why don't we don't hear um, much from the government's response is also partly because there's no access to Tibet. I can't tell you right now exactly, you know, on the dot, how many monasteries have been destroyed, how many Tibetans today got jailed and detained and how many of them went disappeared you know there are actually re-education camps there are um equivalent to concentration camps being built resettlement programs being built languages being erased so many things happening inside of tibet the repression continues to worsen but we're not able to have access to tibet to even find that information out people who even text message or you know send us um in exile the messages about what's happening inside of tibet they get detained and um, are critically sort of attacked right away. And so uh, access to Tibet is so hard. And that's partly why I feel like the governments have not been acting up. And also because of, you know, of course, China has become one of the leading superpowers uh, and wanting to become at least the superpower of the world. And these governments are actually sort of intimidated in many ways to challenge China. Um, and not realizing that if we do create a multilateral forum, there is the possibility to not only challenge, but defeat China and let China know that, you know, the human right violations are not OK and send a strong message to China. Um, and so, yeah, it really comes down to being able to have access to Tibet, to be able to know what's happening. And so that would be sort of my first go to uh, sort of demand for these governments is to be able to have more access Um and then they could do more. So what do we know about what the Chinese have been doing in Tibet since the annexation, since the 1950s? I think there's been a step-by-step -step program to undermine the interests of the Tibetans and to re-engineer -re the demographics of Tibet. So could you go a little, could you explain what's happening there, what we know about it? Mm -hmm. So, you know, from a historical point of view, it's like, China has always been interested in Tibet because Tibet was is is a very strategic place. Um, you know, going back to the times when Brits were trying to, or you know, also take over the world, um, or trying to, um, they knew that you know entrance to China would be only through Tibet, and so Tibet became a very strategic place. And Tibet was the backdoor, sort of the entrance to 
uh, China. And so China, knowing very well that um, Tibet would be the back door, they decided, you know, to make sure that we were uh, captured. Uh, and so it was in China's interest of, in their strategic plan to be uh, taking over Tibet. And then after occupying Tibet, they would sort of give uh, the opportunity to the, sort of the five fingers. It was an analogy that it, it was China's palm. Um, and if um, Tibet has been occupied, which is the palm, then it would have access to sort of the five areas and the five areas being Ladakh, uh, Arunachal, uh, Bhutan, and all of these um, neighboring entities and nations or uh, states that are very much close to India. So since then, uh, China has always had an interest in Tibet um, and then followed by Mao's, the Xi Jinping's rule just only wanted to execute that. And we see that now when China's trying to claim Arunachal as part of China, which it, it clearly isn't because it is the Indo-Tibet border. So inside of t uh, Tibet, in the 1950s, they basically destroyed thousands of monasteries, millions of Tibetans were killed uh, when the annexation happened. Uh, prior to that, in 1951, when they came in, you know, sort of promising modernization, promising to build roads and such, which is the same tactic they're currently using, by the way, in various African nations and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of other sort of developing nations. And they came in that way. And then in 1959, of course, they um, there was tanks that were rolled in and they started attacking our capital city, Lhasa, leading to His Holiness's um, sort of um, uh, escape or escape into exile. And after that, you know, um, they've, the crackdown inside of Tibet has, you know, shifted really after 2008. After 2008 is when um, anybody and everybody that spoke up um, or had any sort of politically sensitive messages being sent out to exile would be detained. Um, and since then, it's only gotten worse. Um, as I said, right now, if we look at how uh, the Chinese government has crafted, they've understood that destroying the three pillars of the Tibetan identity uh, is key for them, is first and foremost, the nomadic way of life. A lot of Tibetans are nomads. So the nomadic way of life is being completely eradicated when they have been displacing nomads into settlement camps. Uh, they're resettling them into concrete homes. Um, and that's one. Two, our language. Um, Tibetan language is actually another major connection to India, historical India and Tibet relations is that and the Tibetan language really came from Tibetan Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism uh, was influenced very much by India. Uh, that's where it came from, right? And so the 33rd mm -hmm. King, um, Sung Tsung Kabo, sent uh, his minister uh, Tumi Samboro mm -hmm. to India to learn Sanskrit and Pali so that he would learn Tibetan, I mean, Indian Buddhism. And then when he came to Tibet, he created Tibetan, uh, the Tibetan language. Since then, you know, Tibetan language is very much part of our identity, not just as a language, but as a medium to understand our religion, uh, which is the third pillar of our sort of Tibetan cultural life is the Buddhist uh, the Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, and it, the sinicization of Tibetan Buddhism has been so vast that, you know, just recently, uh, Wang Zhuzeng, who has been uh, elected or appointed, um, appointed, sorry, as the party leader of Tibet, has mm. promised, uh, actually, in his inaugural speech that he will continue to sinicize the Tibetan Buddhism. And so that's been sort of the uh, approach uh, of the Chinese government. It's to eradicate the Tibetan identity at its core. And just recently, we came to find out about a report that came out by Tibet Action Institute. So based on the Chinese statistics, they've looked at um, uh, sort of the population of Tibetan children, uh, children as young as three, four um and statistically, according to the report, uh, as young as six to seven, up to 18, are being subjected to colonial state-run boarding schools, which means that Tibetan children are being stripped away from their parents uh, and being forced to enter these boarding schools where they are taught, uh, where the system has changed from module one to module two. Module one being taught, you know, they were learning Tibetan, they were learning maths and science through Tibetan and having Chinese and, as an additional language. But now it's been changed to model two, which means the other way around. Everything is being taught in Mandarin and Tibet is just one singular subject that is being taught. You know, when I was in India, I was taught Tamil as my third language. I know how to say hello, wanakom, da, 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 but you know, it's not the same. Uh, and 
that's exactly what the Chinese government is doing. They understand that, you know, all their year, decades of trying to eradicate the Tibetan identity has not worked. Clearly it hasn't because you're talking to a Tibetan person in exile who was born stateless in India, but still has the Tibetan spirit alive and well. Um, so clearly it has not worked and they understand that. And th th their technique now, or their strategy is to now create new generations of Tibetans that do not know about their Tibetan identity. And that's what they're trying to do right now. This is cr crucial because in the next generations to come, you know, if there is no Tibetan identity or the Tibetans are not able to identify their Tibetan identity, then in many ways, whether or not we do have a physical land of Tibet or not, it wouldn't matter. You know, uh, they would just be sort of the same as Chinese. And that's what they're trying to do, which is not going to work. But, you know, that's their attempt at the moment. And in what way is the Tibetan Buddhism being Sinicized? Mm -hmm. Well, first and foremost, we see like translation being done in uh, we see uh, also the power of names, uh, not just Buddhism, but in general, sinicization. Like uh, the, the Chinese government is very particular about using sinicized, uh, like sinicizing uh, sort of names in general, uh, including the border sort of situation that we see in India right now. A lot of our natural places have been, you know, sinicized. The names that they have used uh, instead of, for example, Tuting, they have another sort of sinicization of the name. Uh, even for Tibet, you know, uh, they call it um, the Western treasure is being translated in Chinese. Um, and then we have right now, earlier, you also referred to East Kyrgyzstan as Xinjiang. And Xinjiang is a, actually a name given by the Chinese, right? The, the original name is, is Turkestan. Uh, and Tibet, um, because of the advocacy and of course, because of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Tibet is known to the world as Tibet. And so we don't necessarily hear the sort of the Chinese version of the name. So uh, similarly in Tibetan Buddhism, we have yet to see, but right now um, monasteries are being destroyed completely. How can you teach Tibetan Buddhism without being able to, um, you know, acknowledge the the vast history of Tibetan kings that we've had, Tibetan, um, you know, for a very long time, the state and the sort of religion has always been sort of one, uh, including the institution of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And so uh, separating those two is completely impossible. And that's exactly what the Chinese government is trying to do. So if they're being, if they're trying to synthesize Tibetan Buddhism, it's no longer Tibetan Buddhism in the first place, but that's exactly what they're trying to sort of promote and do. So, in what form does Tibetan culture still persist today? Where does it? Uh, where is it still alive? It's not alive in Tibet anymore. Is it still alive in India, or where is it? Tibetan culture is very much alive and well and preserved by the Tibetan people inside of Tibet. Um, mm -hmm. They are the core uh, to why I personally have a Tibetan identity of my own. Their resistance, the work. The, the amount of uh, sort of pressure and repression that exists for them is ridiculous. And despite all that, they find ways of creative expression. They find ways to cultural pre preserve, right? A lot, a lot of monasteries <clears throat> have built schools within them. And so a lot of the local counties for a very long time, at least uh, up until recently, this whole uh, uh, report about the state-run colonial boarding schools, there were some local counties that were still able to operate, you know, uh, Tibetan schools. And so we saw the monasteries participating in cultural preservation and language preservation. We also know about, you know, a, a shopkeeper named Tashi Wangchuk, who actually did an um, interview with New York Times and then got imprisoned for five years and then um, just recently was released and again uh, has been very vocal about the preservation of the Tibetan language under the Chinese constitution. You know, he's this is a Tibetan shopkeeper who went home to Tibet and saw that his nieces and nephews are no longer being taught Tibetan. And so they're not, you know, seeing that the younger generation is no longer able to even communicate with their grandparents. Um, so not even having that connection with their own family members uh, it created a concern for him. And so using the Chinese constitution, he said, you know, uh, sort of ethnic minorities are allowed to be learning their own language. And he went to take that into court. And that has only led to him to prison. Similarly, there has there's tons of other, you know, inspiration, sources of inspiration for me. Uh, for example, like Gosharap Gyatso, uh, has been 
he's a monk uh, and a scholar he's been writing blogs he's been uh you know really educating and um creating a sense of scholarship uh, amongst Tibetans inside of Tibet. So there's so many, uh, you know, um, scholars, academics, also environmentalists and conservationists that are working to preserve the Tibetan uh, environment. So when it comes to Tibetan culture, it's very much alive and well. And it's actually, I would say, 90% or 95% of the Tibetan culture is alive and well because of the Tibetans inside of Tibet and the faith that they have in His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. You know, they've never given hope, and I know that they will, you know, can never give up hope uh, in the future. Uh, and a very small part of it is played by the folks in exile, uh, who are, there's about 150,000 of us Tibetans living in exile all, all across the world. Um, and we do our part by developing Sunday schools, which is, um, here in Toronto, actually, uh, every Sunday we have uh, at the cultural centers um, an opportunity for young Tibetans to learn their language. So they go to Sunday school to learn their Tibetan language morning till afternoon. And then after afternoon, they uh, actually practice Tibetan dance culture. And so they learn how to do opera singing if they're interested in this, uh, different types of dances that they also learn. Uh, and so these are different ways that we, you know, in exile, both in exile and inside of Tibet, continue to preserve our language and culture. And um, I think the most credit, of course, goes to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who's built the institutions and has allowed for a new set of leadership to come in to be able to continue preserving this. And what is the demographic situation like in Tibet? Because I hear that there are a lot of Han Chinese who have been settled in the region. So that seems to have altered the demographics to a large extent. What do you know about this? Mm -hmm. Um, definitely. And the Chinese government is doing this intentionally, right? It's, it mm -hmm. is to have uh, so many more Chinese folks living inside of Tibetan regions that to one point, uh, in the case that, uh, or when we do um, gain sort of uh, freedom in, in many ways, there's so many Chinese. <laughs> so what type of democracy could be implemented in uh, a free Tibet is also another conversation that for young Tibetans like me who uh, are very much invested in our freedom movement are uh, debating and discussing about. Um, so that's definitely an issue. And it has come to a point where the Chinese um, have you know, uh, definitely do over percent in the Tibetan regions. Um, also, not to mention like the Tibetan map has been sort of reshaped by the Chinese government. You know, many parts of what is now known as part of China is not is is not included um, in the historical Tibet map. The historical Tibet map has definitely been um, decreased in size tremendously, uh, where parts of what uh, what is known as Amdo and Kham are actually now known to be part of China, which it isn't. And so those regions where there are Tibetans as well and is actually historically Tibet um, is now known to be parts of China and uh, there's more Chinese people living there. And anywhere you go, you'll see in Mandarin, right, all the signs and everything has been synthesized completely to a point where you see the Tibetan font, but the Tibetan font is much smaller than the Chinese font that is um, larger. Now, we have a, a Tibetan government in exile in, in Dharamsala. So what role are they playing in the life of the Tibetan people? Mm -hmm. So the Tibetan government in exile, it has really been, um, you know, the core of the Tibetan people in exile. They are the representation of all of the Tibetans living in exile. Uh, we do have a democratic process um, and I personally like to always introduce uh, it as democracy without borders. I think we're one of the very unique cases of a democratic system that does not necessarily have a physical country at the moment because it is an occupied nation, uh, but is still able to operate uh, overseas um, or in exile. And it's actually an example for uh, many other uh, oppressed nations. Um, and the way we work is that you know we hold elections um, uh, every five years and uh, all of the diasporic communities across the world. So we have communities, as mentioned earlier, in North America, but in various parts of Europe. Uh, we also have communities in Nepal and Bhutan and even in Australia, uh, in a small community in South America. So elections are being held in every part of these of the world uh, to elect our new political leader. Um, and 
with that said, there's also various departments of the Tibetan government in exile um, that operates. And so from the basics of the basics of um, the settlement camps, uh, the, the businesses of like land, uh, farmers, or our uh, folks that are doing the uh, folks who are entrepreneurs and doing small businesses and sweater shops, all of the sort of general governance is uh, a branch if not part of the Tibetan government in exile. And so I would say it plays a very core role in sort of uh, the Tibetans that do live in exile. And so much so that even Tibetans inside of Tibet re not only recognize, but also have pay respect and tributes to um, our politically elected leader of the Tibetan government in exile. So for example, um, our former Sikyong, which is Lobsang Sangye, you know, we've heard songs from inside of Tibet referring to him. Uh, and so that, again, is a testament to how much um, the Tibetan government in exile means to not only Tibetans in exile, but also to Tibetans inside of Tibet. And uh, what's the role of, the, of His Holiness, the, the Dalai Lama, in the Tibetan government in exile? Does he have an active role to play in this, or is he at a more elevated level? Uh, so His Holiness the Dalai Lama has uh, been our head of state uh, for you know for centuries, um, and uh, in um, the recent years, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has made a decision to absolve all of his sort of political uh, leadership and really lead the Tibetan people through a spiritual sense. And not just the Tibetan people, His Holiness the Dalai Lama's sort of role in, in the world as a recognized Nobel laureate has been, um, has shifted. His priorities have become more globalized. Uh, and so hence why we hear him whenever we hear him speak, speak to how he is just another ordinary simple monk and his priorities being as a as a human being, part of this sort of seven billion population, uh, it is to um, make sure that everyone attains long-lasting happiness. Uh, uh, and his messages of peace, love, and compassion is sort of the priority. Um, and of course, his work with preservation of the Tibetan uh, Buddhism, um, which has been driven from India, the Nalanda tradition, and the environment. So these are sort of his priorities at the moment. Um, and in terms of the Tibetan people, it's unsaid. Um, you know, he, I would say personally, he is the glue. Uh, he is the, <laughs> the anchor of our Tibetan identity. Um, and in terms of whether or not he's involved in politics is besides the point, like he is um, the, a father figure um, and not just a father figure to many folks. Uh, the, the emanation of uh, Avlokiteshvara, who is here to bring peace and compassion to the world, not just the Tibetan people. And so, yeah, as of right now, he is no longer involved in sort of the political matters. And so the political matters are really head on, taken on by um, the Sikyong, which currently is uh, Pembetsiring. Now, what about the continuation of the institution of the Dalai Lama? Because it's an ancient institution, and uh, you're supposed to have the Dalai Lama reincarnate into a new, to a new person, a new child, and that's how it goes. Now, His Holiness is getting old. I wish that he lives past a hundred. I, I hope so, but eventually he's gonna have to make a choice. I mean, I heard, I don't remember what exactly he said that whether he was going to reincarnate outside Tibet or whether he would not reincarnate at all. So, do we have any clarity? on what happens mm -hmm. after he moves on. Mm -hmm. So um, the decision will be made by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, right? Um, and it uh, will be known to the world when it is time. Uh, and the folks that need to know will know. Um, so that is uh, there. Uh, will the institution continue uh, is again uh, up to the Tibetan people. Um, I'm a firm believer of having agency to the communities that are affected. And so the community is to decide um, the future of its own people. And regarding His Holiness, um, His Holiness has also mentioned, you know, it is up to the Tibetan people whether or not he, he would uh, reincarnate. And uh, we're praying that he would. And um, if he did, uh, hopefully in a free Tibet, and if not, could be in exile. He's also mentioned that he, he would be reincarnated. He, there's a possibility that he could be reincarnated as a female. Um, and so, you know, the questions are endless. However, uh, I don't worry too much about uh, that. Um, 
because I have full faith in um, sort of in both the institution of the Dalai Lama and His Holiness that it, things will work out. But the, the worry is that the Chinese Communist Party will try and hijack the process of appointing the next Dalai Lama the way they did with the Panchen Lama, right? So what's the way, what's the way to circumvent that? Because that needs to be addressed. Yes, definitely. So that is clear cut because His Holiness has also um, directly stated in various interviews that the Chinese uh, government or the Chinese uh, will have no say in the reincarnation of His Holiness and whatever they claim is not going to be uh, legitimate. And that has also sort of been recognized by US um, and we hope to be it to be recognized by various governments internationally um, that any sort of appointment done by the Chinese government will not be legitimate because they are not a true representation of the Tibetan people whatsoever. They can claim all they want about their historical claims are over Tibet. Uh, however, um, none of it stands true when it comes to being able to appoint or uh, select or um, be blessed with uh, the reincarnation of both His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, or any other religious figure per se. You know, they're currently busy doing sinicization of our language and uh, religion. And so if the Chinese government also, who once had Mao say that religion is poison, it does, it does not make any sense for someone, that type of entity, to be deciding uh, a, an, an appointment of another religious figure. Right. Now, the Dalai Lama also stated that he was okay with uh, more autonomy within the Chinese framework. So what's your view on that? Would you be okay with that? So that is the current uh, sort of state um, and stance of the Tibetan government in exile. It's called the middle way. Um, whether or not I'm okay with it, uh, as a young Tibetan who is very much uh, sort of outright and um, loud about her advocacy and activism, um, I am for self-determination. Uh, the right to self-determination, whether or not it, it translates to the middle way policy or true independence or freedom, uh, it is up to the Tibetan people to decide. And it's not something that I necessarily would like to, uh, you know, pick bones or uh, between because ultimately all of it, be it independence or, mid or the middle way, it is for the Tibetan people. Uh, it is about what is possible, what is, there are so many nuances of the complexities of Indo, uh, uh, not Indo, sorry, uh, Tibet-China relationships, right? And so because of that, there are various complexities. And as a young person, uh, I hope to do more studies to research um, the past relationships between these various countries, our neighboring countries, also to further understand uh, the geopolitical situation of the world because anything could change at any point you know we could we nobody had guessed that the world war one would happen nobody guessed world war two would happen nobody had guessed that the cold war would end so similarly the chinese government and uh, the ccp is also ba bound to fall uh, someday or the other and so when it does fall what would be the future of not only tibet but also all these other regions that are affected by china like hong kong uh, east Turkestan? the future is untold and it is for us to write. And so uh, depending on where the Tibetan youth and the Tibetan people, specifically Tibetans inside of Tibet, uh, want and feel, I think it is up to them to decide the future of Tibet. Now, there is a, a section of Tibetan society that advocates a more active resistance to China. I mean, if you look at the history of Tibet in the 8th century or so, the Tibetan king conquered China, whatever what was the capital of China at the time. And after some time, after a few centuries, Tibet became a very pacifist kind of culture. And there are certain people within the Tibetan community, I, whom I know, who advocate armed resistance against China. So what's your view about that? Do you think it's something that should be considered? Well, every nation does have uh, its sort of takes on um, national security. And so there is uh, a need in um, sort of a nation state to have uh, some sort of level of national security. So be it armed struggle or um, sort of other types of resistance or strategic resistance, there must be some sort of level of security that needs to be pertained. Um, and so 
regarding whether or not um, our struggle is that, I think it's important to, again, reflect on the past, uh, understand the past, and also be able to strategize for the future. You know, even having an armed struggle now, um, we must understand, we must be practical. Uh, you know, the Chinese government is become this giant entity that all of the Western nations are to some degree scared of in, and intimidated to challenge. Uh, and oftentimes their go-to threat is one, economic and trade relations, and two, you know, possible war of some sort because they're constantly working on their um, sort of military power. Um, and we see that with the acquisition of the sort of Sri Lankan seaports um, and um the strategic ways of their Belt and Road Initiative. So they're constantly thinking about the larger picture. And so for the Tibetan people, I think personally, uh, we need to also think about sort of the longer game. And so I personally stand by the nonviolent movement. I draw a lot of inspiration personally from uh, the Black uh, Civil Rights Movement. We have, uh, I mean, of course, Gandhi is also... Um, uh, a source of inspiration in terms of the nonviolent struggle. Um, and yeah, I draw full faith and I, I do have faith in that uh, nonviolent struggle because, yeah, the future is untold and I have full faith that the young Tibetans will rise in the time that it needs to be risen. So what's your hope for the future of Tibet? What do you wish to see within your lifetime? I hope to return to a free Tibet. What that means is for the Tibetan people to decide, but um, I've been born in a, uh, as a stateless person. Uh, there's a saying that you know I grew up with, and I often share with other young Tibetans, is that whenever Tibet, young Tibetans dreamt big in India, we'd always be reminded by actually the older generation and other people that there was a big R on our forehead. This R meant that we were refugees. Uh, which to some degree is also not relevant because the UNHCR does not recognize us as refugees, so they were technically stateless people. Um, but they would often remind us that there, there was a big R on our forehead, which meant that anything that we dreamt of would be limited. Um, but, you know, uh, based on what I see, uh, the activation, the fire, the fuel inside of the young Tibetans uh, in exile and also the ones that I can see inside of Tibet, uh, to which we have access of, um, it only draws, um, you know, it only gives me more inspiration to uh, continue the work that we do. And um, I have also reclaimed that big R on our forehead. And by reclaim, I mean that now I do say, yes, there is an R on our forehead, but that R doesn't mean just refugee. It means resistance. Um, and and I stand by it because I see that I see it coming and it has been there and I see a new wave of young Tibetans rising uh, who are not just you know worried about Tibet as a Tibetan issue but are able to present the nuances of how the Tibetan issue is actually an issue of all of humanity because Tibet is actually the water source and uh, the water tower of serving water to almost 2 billion people in the world. Uh, that's one third, almost one third of the population. And given that we are all currently in the world perspective as a global citizen, we are seeing a climate crisis. And given that, uh, Tibet will have a huge role. Um, and when I connect to young people here in North America, I often say, you know, you know, Batman trained in uh, Tibet. You know, why did he do that? Or if you see like all of these uh, sci-fi movies in like 2012 and such, Tibet often is the last place on earth to survive. It's the last place to be affected. Um, and um, there's a reason why. And so Tibet has a role in benefit to not just Tibetans, but all of the world, uh, I would say. Well, I can assure you that as long as Tibet is not free, the Tibetan, pe the Tibetan people will always have a home, an interim home in India. And you will never be foreigners here. So I can assure you of that. So, Chevi uh, Lamo, thank you so much. Thank you so much for a wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here.